Welcome to Safe Harbor Fellowship Baptist Church Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, I pray that, that these studies that we've been doing uh, will be a blessing to you all uh, during these trying times that we're going to. Uh, my heart's desire is to help all of us uh, focus on Jesus and not on COVID-19 for a while. I mean, I know we have to, it's, it's what's going on in our world and we have to be aware and we have to protect ourselves and we have to do our social distancing and all the things that we need to do. Personally, because of the job that I have and the work that I do, I wear a mask all day long. So, uh, which most people think is a good thing because it, you know, hides some of the ugly. But anyway, uh, I uh, just wanted to teach you a little bit tonight. We're, we're starting uh, our build-up to Resurrection Sunday. And so I'm praying uh, you will stay with us all the way through that day. It's like four lessons that we're going to do uh, culminating in uh, Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday, if you will. So today, <clears throat> I want to talk to you about legalism and actually give you a warning against legalism. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, we're going to look at verses 16 and 17, and then we will be looking at verses 20 through 23. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get started. My Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you, and, and we thank you for loving us. Lord, I thank you that you're there for us all the way through everything that goes on in our lives, Lord. And now... Uh, we're having some trying times, and I, I just pray, Lord, that uh, right now that you would just comfort our hearts, that you would strengthen us in our resolve to be uh, good witnesses for you, to live our lives that would glorify you. And Father, as we come to this study tonight, Lord, I pray that you would give me exactly the words you would have me to say. And Father, I pray that as people are listening to this and watching this, that you would open their hearts, Lord, and open their minds that they might receive what you have for them. And Lord, we do love you and we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your precious son, Jesus Christ, and his dying on the cross for us. And we just ask you to meet here with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. So today I want us to look at the warnings against legalism through this section of scripture. So let's read some verse and we'll get started here. Colossians chapter 2 beginning in verse 16 says let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the sabbath which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of christ so i want to start out with those two verses right there and uh, give us a perspective of why we are no longer bound by the ordinances I want us to start by getting an understanding of verses 16 and 17 here. And then once we get that down, then we will move on to verses 20 through 23. But this, getting these two verses down is the key to understanding those. So, so we're going to be looking at the content of verse 16. And, and of course, set it into the context of our study in verse 17. We'll, we'll put our study into the context of Scripture of both Old and New Testament so that we have the full picture of what God is saying to us here. And then after, after we get that down in these two verses, then we will uh, spend our remaining time in verses 20 through 23 and uh, see how this all applies in our lives today. Now, with Easter, if you will, just around the corner. I believe it's important to, to get God's mind on the subject and not man's because man's is always messed up. So let's look at verse 16 again and we'll see what I'm, I'll show you what I'm talking about. The first thing it says in, in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16 is let no man. See, Paul starts immediately, immediately telling us that man is the problem. Man is always the one that perverts judgment. It's not God. 
God's judgment is always true and correct. Man is the one that messes it up. So it says, let man therefore. Let, I'm sorry, let no man therefore. So what's the therefore therefore? Well, that takes us back to verse 14. So let's take in our Bibles and just look up a couple of verses. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14 where it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So we see that, that Jesus Christ took the ordinances out. Look, look, Jesus, Jesus, the Bible tells us, fulfilled the Old Testament law. And thus, when he was nailed to the cross, so were the ordinances. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple when you look at it uh, in the simplicity of the Word of God. They're over and gone for us. It goes on there and he says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat. In meat, that speaks of the things you eat. Not just flesh, but everything that you eat. It also has to do with the way that the food is prepared. You know, because people can get all wound up about that too. But it doesn't matter. That's the point. It doesn't matter. And it says of meat or in drink. A lot of people get, uh, get wound up in that one too. It's the things you drink, all of them. You know, so, so people uh, talk about drinking alcohol. Drinking alcohol, I, I don't agree with it. I mean... It, if you drink alcohol to the point that it affects your mind, then you're sinning against God. But to have a glass of wine is not a sin against God if it doesn't affect you. If you're an alcoholic, you want to stay away from it. But, but that's what that Paul's point is. Don't let somebody judge you in that. And then he says, the holy days. Literally a feast day or a festival. Now, look, the Jews had holy days that they kept. So did the Gentiles. There was conflict between the people because of their observance of these days. Look, that wasn't something that was foreign to that time period. We still have that today. People get all bent out of shape about it. I mean, man, Easter and Christmas, pagan holidays. I hear it all the time. I have a, had a guy at work just a couple of days ago ask me. He goes, Are your church celebrate Easter? I was like, well, we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, and that's what the world calls Easter. So, yeah, I guess we do. You know, uh, what's the big deal? We celebrate Christmas, too. You know, Paul says, hey, just shut up. Don't worry about it. Just shut up. That's all man stuff. God really don't care one way or the other. We'll see that here in a little bit. Then he goes on in verse 16. He says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy, of a holy day or of the new moon. Oh, there's one for you, isn't it? Yeah, the new moon. See, both Jew and Gentile celebrate the new moon, but for different reasons and in very different ways. Look, Psalm 81 and 3 says, Blow up the trumpet in the new moon in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. Jews were required to celebrate the new moon feast. The Gentiles observed the new moons uh, for many different superstitious reasons. It wasn't a requirement of God. It's just something that they did. All right? Guess what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's what this passage is about. And then he says Sabbath days. Now, if you, if you look at this, it literally is speaking of the seventh day Sabbath observance of the Jews. The Jews had a lot of Sabbath days, and we're gonna, as we go through our study, building up to uh, to the crucifixion and the resurrection, we're going to talk about a couple of those Sabbaths. But 
uh, for right now, just understand that they had the Sabbath days, and this one is, is referring specifically to the seventh day. And, you know, I'm not going to get into a lengthy discourse on that. We'll do it later. We'll get, we'll get into it. Uh, what I want us to see is how they apply to you and me. See, how, how, how we look at these things is important in our walk. Now, in Romans chapter 14, and uh, if you want to turn there in your Bibles, I, I would encourage you to do that. If you look at verses 1 through 12, Paul gives a great discourse on this very subject of, of the holidays and the meat and the drink and all this stuff. And he does that in, in Romans 14, verses 1 to 12. But then he sums it all up in verse 13. And that's what I want us to look at right now is verse 13 where he says, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, <clears throat> that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. See, that, that is the code of conduct for a Christian. If you're with somebody that, that doesn't believe that you should eat pork, don't eat it. If you're with somebody that thinks that it's a sin against God to have a glass of wine, don't drink it. That's the, that's the code of conduct of a Christian. But, look, it's not, it doesn't matter, right? It, it's not a big deal. You don't need it, so just don't do it. If it's going to cause a brother to stumble or a weaker person to stumble, just don't do it. It's okay. The things that we just saw here in, in, in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16 where it says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. It's all ordinances that we are not obligated to keep. Some people choose to keep some of them. Some people maybe try to keep all of them. I don't know. It doesn't matter. We're not to judge what somebody else does with these things, and we're not to let them judge us for what we do with them, right? So let's move on to verse 17, because this is, this is where it gets important, very important for us. It says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Which, speaking of the things in verse 16, the meat, the drink, the holy days, the new moon, the Sabbath days, it's all the ordinances that we talked about, we read about in verse 14, that were nailed to the cross. We're not obligated to them. But the verse 17 tells us that they're shadow, they're a shadow of things to come. Now the word shadow means a faint representation. Did you get that? A faint representation. It's like when you're standing out on a sunny day and you see the dark behind you, that's a shadow. That's a faint representation of you. See, folks, in Bible study, you have to always keep everything in context. Otherwise, you'll end up reading a verse and, 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 and say, well, the body of Christ is the church. Hold on. What's that talking about? Let's back up a little bit. See, it's a shadow. It's a shadow. What Paul is saying is that the meat and the drinks and the holidays, they're a faint representation of what's to come. Let me show you this. Let me show you this. It says, what is he really talking about here? In Exodus 25 and 9, and we're not turning there, but in Exodus 25 and 9, and then again in Exodus 25 and verse 40, 
The Bible says that God showed Moses a pattern to follow to build the tabernacle. But in Hebrews chapter 5, chapter 8 and verse 5, I'm sorry, in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, the Bible tells us that the pattern was a shadow. And then in Hebrews 10 and verse 1, it says that the law also had a shadow of good things to come. They are but a faint representation of something much more grand. But what? If they're a shadow, what are they a, a faint representation of? Look at verse 17 again. It says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now we need to pay attention. As I said, I said a moment ago, we need to pay attention to this because we don't want to get what is said here confused with what we often hear. Now the church, let me say this, the church is the body of Christ. But that's not in context what we have here in verse 17, read the verse again with me. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. See, see the, the body is that which casts a shadow as opposed to the shadow itself. Look, remember the example I just gave you moments ago when you stand out in the sunlight. You're the body. The, the black silhouette that you see is your shadow. It's the faint representation of you. Well, the body here is of Christ. Okay, let me put it another way. The shadow, the faint representation that we've been talking about, those things, all of those things that we talk about, speak of Christ. They are the pictures or the patterns that you see all through the Bible. He is the body that casts the shadow. Now, understand, as Christians, we're part of that body. But in context, He is the body. Let me show you why that is so important. Take your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I want to read verses 23 through 26. Verses 23 through 26. You ready? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23 says, By faith Moses... When he, was, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Stay with me. Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You say, okay, where are you going with this? I told you verse 26. Okay, let's go to verse 26. Follow along. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Did you get that? Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Wait a minute. Jesus isn't mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament, is he? Did you see the name Jesus in there anywhere? Maybe Moses knew something we didn't. Hmm? 
Maybe we missed it when we were reading back through the Old Testament. But Moses understood. And that's not all. That's not all. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 22, the Bible says, And I saw no temple therein, speaking of the, the New Jerusalem, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So how does that work for you? I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you put all this together? How about that pattern? Huh? Okay. So here, here, here's the point. God did show Moses a pattern of the temple in the tabernacle because Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem, from the temple, for a thousand years. But the point in our text is that all of those things in the Old Testament was pointing to Christ in the New Testament, and when it is all done, there will be no more need for shadows, patterns, or pictures, because Christ fulfills it all in Him. Self. All right, that's on. So that's verses 16 and 17. Let's move on in our study and look at verses 20 through 23. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. The Bible says, Wherefore, if ye be dead, with Christ from the rudiments of the world? Why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Wow. So all of this stuff that people try to put us under and try to tell us we need to do this and we need to do that or we need to live like this or we need to live like that or everybody has their own ideas. But look, it has nothing to do with what the Bible says. Verse 20 starts out with wherefore. So you say, what's the wherefore therefore, right? Because of what we just learned. All the stuff is completed in Christ. He removed everything that was against us and fulfills everything we need. says, if ye be dead with Christ, being dead to the sin and the world. See, before Jesus, before Jesus, we were dead in sin. Now in Christ, we are dead to sin. See the difference? It says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, the rudiments of the world, the principles and practices of the world's system. Paul makes an interesting statement here. Why, as though living in the world, think about that for a minute. Let's look at it in the context of the verse. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ, from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to the ordinances? Are you really living in the world or not? Now, don't hang up on me. Hold on a minute. It depends on from what perspective you're looking at it. See, from God's perspective, 
If you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, if you have placed your faith and trust in Him, from God's perspective, you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. Give me just a moment, and I'll turn back here to Ephesians chapter 2. Come along with me. Ephesians chapter 2. And here's what it says. Verse 1 says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Look at verse 3. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So we all had the same conversation, right? We all lived in the world. We were all sinners caught up in the world system, in the rudiments, as we see in Colossians chapter 2, of the world. All right, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us or made us alive together with Christ by grace, are ye saved? Now look at verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look at the way that verse is structured. And hath. That's past tense. Folks, the moment, the moment that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, God sees you as His Son seated in heavenly places in Christ. That's why the whole New Testament talks about the, the doctrine of being in Christ. That's where we're at, from God's perspective. Now you say, well, last time I looked, I was walking around on earth. That's why i got to deal with this COVID-19, right? Because we're here on this earth. But look, we're not here in God's way of looking at it. Because in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, the Bible says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, our conversation is heaven, and that's from where we're looking for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, why, since you're seated in heavenly places, are you subject to the ordinances of the world? It's a, another interesting word here. It means a decree or law. But what I, I really found interesting about as I was studying this is that it comes from the same Greek word, Greek word that we get the word dogmatic, which, which is pertaining to an established principle or doctrine authoritatively. I also found it interesting that this is the only time that this particular word appears in Scripture. So Paul's question is, why, when you don't live here, this is not your residence. Why are you subject or allow yourself to be subject to this kind of stuff? Now, he's not saying to go out and violate man's laws. That's not what he's saying. All of Romans chapter 13 tells us that we're to obey man's laws. Look. Even the world, the world system, gives diplomatic immunity to ambassadors from other countries. Folks, we're ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that. We're ambassadors for Christ. We've already seated, we've already seen, I should say, that we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're here on earth as his ambassadors. We have diplomatic immun immunity and we need to exercise it.
So let's look at these ordinances real quick. Touch not, taste not, handle not. which all are to perish with the using. The ordinances are going to perish. Why? Because they are man-made. Understand that. They are man-made. Man makes them to control people like you and I, or me. These are commandments and doctrines of men, not of God. They don't work and they don't last. Look, I could tell you if you cut your hair a certain way and you dress a certain way and you speak a certain way and you eat certain foods that then you're going to be righteous and holy. And you know what I would be doing? lying to you. You become righteous and holy by placing your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who took all the nonsense, all the laws, all the ordinances and nailed them to His cross. Look at verse 23. Which things have indeed a shoe of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. They have a show, a show of wisdom. It looks like you are real holy. But all it's doing is feeding the flesh. Paul says over there in Romans chapter 7, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So if you've got no good thing dwelling in your flesh, why would you want to feed it? The Bible tells us that the, the spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. Why feed the flesh? Feed the spirit. Our goal is a relationship with the God of heaven. A relationship with Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter, chapter 5 and verse 1, and I'll conclude my message here quickly. Galatians 5 and 1 says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of of bondage. Listen, my friends, Christ has set you free from the law and the ordinances so that you may freely serve Him. Do not ever allow any man to put you back under bondage. Ever. John 8 and 36 says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So the question that you must answer right now is, Have I been set free? Do you know Jesus Christ as your own? So you see, what we have seen today is your life if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior. If, if you've never asked Him to save you, now's the time. Now's the time. The Bible tells us in, in uh, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. It says this, it says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Paul goes on in verse 13 and says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. Won't you come out of bondage today? Won't you pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and save you? It's very simple. It's very simple. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can follow after me. The prayer will not save you. It's what you believe in your heart. The prayer is simply asking God, speaking to God about what you believe in your heart. Let's pray. Father God, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Father, I ask just now that you would send Jesus Christ into my heart and save me. Lord, I know that I can't do it on my own. I want the freedom that comes from knowing Jesus. Please, forgive me of my sin. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, and believe it in your heart, God will save you. God has saved you. You're now a child of God. You have been set free.